أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين. Tonight, inshallah, is the second installment of of our خاطرة on آية number thirty four from سورة النساء. And inshallah, just quickly to refresh our memories, Allah سبحانه وتعالى says in سورة النساء الرجال قوامون على النساء. بما فضل الله بعضهم على بعض وبما أنفقوا من أموالهم فالصالحات قانتات حافظات للغيب بما حفظ الله فإن أطعناكم فلا تبغوا عليهن سبيلا بما حفظ الله واللاتي تخافون نشوزهن فعظهن وهجرهن في المضاجع واضربهن فإن أطعناكم فلا تبغوا عليهن سبيلا إن الله كان عليا كبير uh, and and I, I basically covered a few things last time, and I said that um, I talked about the concept of qawama and what it means. I talked about the conditions of that qawama, and I uh, mentioned just a little bit about uh, the favors that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given men, uh, and the leadership that is expected of them. I also spoke about a financial capability and being the bread earner of the family. I also spoke about the concept of nushuz, and what it means, and I have uh, established, you know, as I, I quoted Shaykh uh, al-Mufassirin, uh, al-Imam Mujahid, Mujahid ibn Jabr, and he's the one that, uh, uh, that Ibn Kathir, and particularly at tabari actually uh, quoted so many times, I would say thousands and thousands of times in their tafsir, they would quote Mujahid. Uh, and uh, uh, Imam, Imam Mujahid ibn Jabr basically says that al uh, in his in, in his opinion, and this is the opinion that is accepted by most of the scholars of tafsir, عدم التمكين في الفراش when when basically the wife refuses to uh, 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 let herself be with her husband intimately for no good reason on no proper or reasonable grounds or rational grounds whatsoever um, and I talked about the three-step program that the ayah prescribes um, it starts with فَعِذُوهُنَّ admonish them and give them advice uh, and I haven't I haven't really detailed that yet uh, and the second step of that program is أُهْجُرُهُنَّ فِي الْمَضَاجِعَ Abandon them in bed. And the third one is إِضْرِبُهُنَّ uh, Which basically translates to English as hit them. Uh, so let me inshallah pick it up right from there and, and start talking about that three-step program that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala prescribed after we've established the things that we needed to establish uh, the night before, uh, before last. فَعِضُوهُنَّ is the very first step. So if the husband feels that his wife is refusing to be with him intimately, uh, on no rational grounds, on no reasonable grounds, out of arrogance, uh, then the first step in this program is فَعِضُوهُنَّ And let me share with you something that I've experienced firsthand. There was a couple that I tried to counsel about three years ago, just so that you understand what نُشُوز really means, right? And they were having financial disagreements, and basically both of them are professionals and they have teenage uh, children. Uh, so they have a, uh, a financial disagreements on how the money should be spent in the family. So because the wife wanted to punish her husband because he didn't agree with her, she basically refuses to, to be with him intimately, right? So they came to me one of those days for counseling. And wallahi, brothers and sisters, Allah, Allah is my witness in Ramadan. I quote, this is what, what she said. She said to her husband in my presence, in my office, she looked him in the eye and she said to him, I'm not your bathroom. And I will let you use your imagination to understand what she meant by that. And it is an atrocity, in my judgment, for a woman, right, to consider intimacy with her husband and to, to be something that is so bad, to equate that with, you know, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive us all, you know, this, this act, right? And, and, and for me, wallahi, I remember that number 34 of Surah An-Nisa, when she was talking about this. The, the language, the, the attitude, the way she, I haven't seen her, seen the couple, by the way, you know, ever since then. But the attitude tells me that the shoes is about something that is, that is sinister. There's something malicious about it, right? It is not, it is not because it, it, it is not halal for, for any woman to refuse 
to be intimate with her husband unless there are reasonable grounds. And it is not halal for a husband to refuse to be intimate with his wife either. Whatever we expect of women must be also expected of men. Okay? So I'm just giving you an example to understand what nushuz really means. So the first step when you feel that nushuz from your wife is فَعِذُوهُنْ Admonish them. Give advice. Try to talk and communicate. Try to articulate your need to her. Try to see, have I done anything that offended you? Why are you upset? Did I say something that made you angry? Uh, is it that thing from last week? Are you still upset about that? I apologize. Let me kiss you on the forehead. Right? If it is something that is, that is bigger, a, a bigger issue in the relationship, let's go talk to the Iman. Can we go for counseling? Inshallah, we can work this out. Do you understand what fa'idhuhunna means? Let me ask you this question, brothers and sisters. And mashallah, you're all very well educated. Knowing what we know now in the Western world, all the information that we have, all the knowledge, all the empirical evidence, all the, the knowledge about counseling and, and relationships, would you or would you not agree with me that good articulation and good relationship in any, uh, and good communication in any relationship resolves 95% of the problems? Would you not agree with me? 95% of any marital issue could be resolved if husband and wife sat down and actually spoke about it. Give them advice and talk to them and communicate and admonish them will take care of 95% of the problems. Just good articulation to the problem. Telling your wife, I understand that you're upset and I really apologize and, and, and let it go one night and then a couple of nights later come talk to her. And be honest with her. Tell her, you know, I'm your husband and you, and you expect our relationship to be a, a, a loyal, loving relationship. You expect my full fidelity and you expect me to be a monogamous partner to you. So you cannot deny me the satisfaction that I need and expect in my own marriage and in my own relationship. That is called articulation. You put it to her in clear terms. You tell her, you know, you're, you're pushing me, you know, I'm an honest and an honorable man. I'm not going to, you know, God forbid, you know, do something haram with, with another woman. But, but I, I, I might look, I might, you know, be thinking about things that I shouldn't be thinking about. And I don't want to do that. And I'll be mostly responsible, but you're going to be partially responsible as well. Because I am talking to you and I'm trying to resolve the situation with you and you're not giving me a chance. You're not trying to seek a, a, out a solution with me. Right? You put everything on the table through the fa'idhuhunna step. I promise you, 95% of the issues that led to nushuz in the first place will be resolved. Okay? Now, what about the remaining 5%? There's a sister that is, that is simply looking at it differently. She is basically not interested in apologies. She's not interested in, in, in the admonition. She's not interested in advice. She's not responding to communication. And there are extremely rare people who are so unreasonable that they would not pick a solution from, from the table, even if that solution is divorce, by the way. Divorce could be that solution. If nothing works, at least be honest and tell your husband, I can't live with you anymore. What I see is that some sisters, they just want to be in the semblance of a relationship. Why? Because of financial dependability. They want the money. And, 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 and there is also the, the kids factor. But my sisters, it is haram to do that. I'm telling you right now. If you stay with your husband and you refuse to be with your husband, but you stay with him just because you want his money and you want his support and you want to make sure that the children you know, have the father in their lives or whatever other excuses without letting him be your husband, you're doing something haram. And therefore you must respond to admonition even if it means divorce. You know what, Abdullah, I'm sorry, I, I see where you're, where you're coming from, but I think that our differences are irreconcilable. And let us just, you know, in a civilized way, part ways with each other, inshallah, take care of the kids as divorced men and women and show respect to each other. That could be a solution, right? But the solution is not to keep things sliding and to refuse to talk to your husband, to refuse to uh, communicate with your husband, turn down his apologies and, and think that we can just keep, keep going like this for months and years. It's haram to do that, right? So for that very small percentage of relatively unreasonable women, very extremely rare percentage, the next step is 
as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, فَهْجُرُهُنَّ فِي الْمَضَاجِعِ وَهْجُرُهُنَّ فِي الْمَضَاجِعِ Abandon them in bed. And now I, I, I know that most of you think you know what that means. Okay? Most people, if I ask them, they think, okay, sleep on another bed, right? Get up and sleep on another, abandon them in beds, right? فَهْجُرُهُنَّ فِي الْمَضَاجِعِ But if that were the case, it would have said, فَهْجُرُ الْمَضَاجِعِ Or, فَهْجُرُهُنَّ مِنَ الْمَضَاجِعِ but it says, فَهْجُرُهُنَّ فِي الْمَضَاجِعِ Abandon them in bed. What does that mean? It means sleep on the right side and look at the wall and fall asleep. <laughs> right? It means don't talk to her. She's still, you guys, both of you are still sleeping on the same bed. But you are basically symbolically telling her, you know what? I'm not going to be manipulated, I'm not going to be exploited because of my desire. I desire you as my wife, but you're obviously taking advantage of that, and I'm not going to let that happen. I'm not going to be exploited. Our relationship is not going to be exploited because you think that my desire will overwhelm me, and then I will come, you know, just give you everything you want. And, and, and make unreasonable concessions. I'm not going to do that. Okay? That's one side of it. But the other side is that you're still in bed. What does that mean? It means you are saying, well, I tried so hard admonition and advice and I've been trying to communicate and apologize for two weeks and you're not responding and so I'm getting upset and I don't know what to do and, and I'm not going to let you exploit me this way, but I'm still right here in bed. If you want to talk about it, we can talk. <laughs> right? It is using a little bit of reverse psychology as well, you know, because when you're, when you're, the, the admonition process, the, the, the Ayyuhunna part, is man constantly talking to his wife, please forgive me, I'm sorry, let's talk about it, let's get some counseling, this and that, whatever I did, you know, I'll, I'll buy you a gift. And none of that works, and, and your wife is, <laughs> she doesn't want to talk, right? Next step, reverse psychology, you go like this. Right, what is she going to do? Hopefully, 4% of the remaining 5% will heed the warning and be like, okay, fine, you know, let's talk about this. Right? So hopefully if you, if you abandon them in bed, like sleep in the same bed, but you know, kind of don't talk to them, turn your face to the other side, and go on like this for a couple of nights, hopefully, inshallah ta'ala, this will resolve the remaining of the problem. So now we've covered 99%. 99% of the cases should be covered by the first two steps. And the third step is فَضْرِبُهُنَّ Right? Hit them. Now, there are so many contemporary scholars who have, very apologetically rather, tried to translate فَضْرِبُهُنَّ as uh, walk away, you know, as in ضَرْبًا فِي الْأَرْضِ For example, you know, in, in Surah Al-Muzzammil. Uh, or يَضْرِبُونَ فِي الْأَرْضِ you know, they are hustling and struggling in the earth, you know, trying to make their living and stuff like that. So go get busy with work and just leave her at home. It doesn't mean that. It, that's just a completely apologetic, Western-oriented perspective on the ayah, trying to show people, hey, the Quran doesn't say hit them. It does. It does. The third step is فَضْرِبُهُنَّ Hit them. And I'll tell you, inshallah, in the course of this khatira, what that actually means. Some of you think you know what it, what it means, but I'll tell you, what it actually means. Let me go back to what I said in, in my last khatira about the historical and the social context. Remember what Umar ibn Khattab said after they moved to, uh, to Medina, the Muhajirin? They basically said, just to refresh our memories, they basically said that, you know, we, the people of Muhajirin, we used to have full control over our wives and we, we were a little bit violent. You know, we, we, we used to, you know, Ahlu Makkah kanu darradin al-nisa. They, they used to hit their wives. And that was the norm in Mecca. It was not the norm in Medina. The women of Medina were very honorable. They rejected that. And, and their families would, would automatically divorce them from their wives, from their husbands, if they knew that the husbands are using physical violence with them. But the telling thing that Umar said, the Allah and Allah, is that, وَجَعَلَ نِسَاءُ الْمُهَاجِرِينَ يَتَأَدَّبْنَ بِأَدَبِ نِسَاءِ الْأَنصَارِ Gradually, the women of Muhajireen, they started absorbing all the qualities of the women of Ansar, so gradually they are refusing to let their husbands lay fingers on them. And to make matters more complicated, the Prophet 
One of the very first injunctions he imposed on the people of Medina in the first year of Hijrah, in the hadith, very famous. So this is what Imam Shafi says. لا تضربوا إماء الله Don't hit your wives. Don't hit your wives. وطبعا الصحابة كانوا وقافين عند حدود الله. The companions of the Prophet ﷺ, they would stand where the boundaries are. They would never cross them. It doesn't matter what their cultural expectations are. Rasulullah ﷺ said, don't touch them. We can't touch them. But the hearts are boiling from inside. They went on like this for years. The muhajireen are accepting it. And the women are getting stronger and stronger. And that's a society that is not balanced. Because it, they came from one extreme. The pendulum has to swing all the way to the other extreme. So now women are exercising this power and authority over their husbands to the extent that the Sahaba came to the Prophet ﷺ and they said, Ya Rasulullah, لَقَدْ زَأَرَتِ النِّسَاءُ فِي الرِّجَالِ You know, Zair, the roaring of a lion? Women are roaring in their husbands' faces. The situation has become very sensitive, the Prophet of Allah. I don't know what to do with my wife anymore. She's yelling at me constantly and I can't lay a finger on her. And communication is not working. Nothing is working with her. She just wants to have her way. لَقَدْ زَأَرَتِ النِّسَاءُ فِي الرِّجَالِ يَا رَسُولَ اللَّهِ And the Prophet ﷺ was being subjected to a tremendous amount of pressure. Now remember, he is now being called a feminist. He's being called that he's giving more leniency to women. He's revolutionizing how society is supposed to treat women. He's talking about, you know, uh, 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 increasing their inheritance and treated, treating them equally. So Rasulullah is there, you know, being pressured so much. A couple of years into, into Hijrah, after Hijrah, like fourth or fifth year, the Prophet eventually, just to, because again, you have to understand, divorce rates were on the rise in Medina. Because men were not trained to handle their, their domestic issues you, with any other means except just yelling at their wives or hitting them. They, they, they didn't know. They, they didn't know better, so they did not have any resources to teach them how to handle the situation. So you know what? Intitalaq. I divorce you. Khalas. So divorce rates are on the rise. Men are extremely upset in Medina, and many of them are complaining to the Prophet So a couple of years into Hijrah, after they have upheld that ruling for, for a few years, he eventually gave them permission to hit their wives under extreme circumstances. If she's completely out of control, you know, hit her in a, way, a very light way. He was being very apologetic and upset. The Prophet said that. Now that same night, that same night, he gave them that ruling in the morning, they say, فَأَتَتْ عَلَى النَّبِيِّ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمْ سَبْعِينَ, سبعين مِنَ النساء. Oh. <laughs> 70, of course, when they say 70 in, in the language of the Arabs, they mean so many. It was hundreds. They all came to the Prophet وسلم, to the masjid crying, Oh, our husbands hit us, our husbands hit us, Ya Rasulullah. Why did you give them permission to do that? And the Prophet was like, Oh, man. <laughs> And he, of course, was so upset, and he told everyone, لَيْسُ هَؤُلَاءِ بِخِيَارِكُمْ Whoever did that can never be among the honorable in this community. Whoever did this is a, is a dishonorable man. But you're talking about many men, hundreds of men, that did that to their wives. And it was right then and there, when you have two extremes between don't touch them, and the other extreme that says hit them, that's when Surah An-Nisa was revealed in the seventh year of Israel. And the ayah carried with it the regulation of the process. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uses the graduality of the Quran that he uses with other things. I'll talk about this in a second. He uses the same graduality to abolish a bad habit after letting the community try the two extremes. Right? Now, the very first step, hitting is only permissible in situations of nushuz. She disobeys you, her food is bland. She spends way too much time with her, uh, at, her, at her mother's. None of that matters anymore. You can only hit, right, when it's a situation of nushuz. And I explained that. Number two, you have to go through the three-step program first. And you have to try that for weeks. And if it doesn't work, you go on to, to step number two. And if that doesn't work, that's when you have the permission to hit. 
Now some of you might say, okay, that, that's nice and dandy. <laughs> but why is it that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala still didn't say in the Quran, don't hit your wife? Why, why is the door still open? And I say to you, it is the way Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala handled all other social illnesses. Fornication, consumption of alcohol, slavery, polygamy, all the, the practices of jahiliyyah that the Arabs used to practice, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala abolished them gradually. Take polygamy for example. It is not that the Quran addressed a society that was monogamous and told people, hey guys, uh, rejoice. You can marry three more women. It is the exact opposite. It addressed a society where men were so polygamous that they would have 10, 15, and 20 wives. And they were ordered to divorce most of them and keep a maximum of four. You have to understand the social context. Otherwise, you misread the Quran. Right? When it talked about alcohol, it did not address a sober society. It addressed a society that was consuming alcohol. That was selling it. That was, was making so much money out of it. So the prohibition was very gradual until it was eventually abolished. Same with slavery. It was the cornerstone of their economy. And it was gradually abolished. Right? So the ayah of hitting women did not address a civilized society that does not lay a finger on women. And then it was like, okay, now you guys can start hitting your wives. Oh, okay. Bismillah. <laughs> it wasn't like that. It was the other way around. We are addressing a society that already hits its women and we're trying to curb a bad practice by imposing a regulatory process. You follow the letter of the law. But let's even make it more complicated. The Prophet ﷺ said that whoever lays a finger on his wife, aside from a situation of nushuz, will be punished and retribution will be delivered. A woman came to Rasul ﷺ and said, Ya Rasulullah, my husband hit me. So he invited him, asked about the situation, investigated it, which is what the Quda, the judges used to do later on after the Prophet passed away. Investigated and then he ruled your hitting of her was not justified. It was intense. It was not darban ghayr mubarrih. It wasn't light, as I said. And I'll explain what, actual, what light actually means because it's not, it is not up to everyone's discretion. And number two, it was not in a situation of discretion. Al-qisas al-qisas. Retribution. And he called upon his wife and he said, Your husband is right there. Go slap him the way he slapped you. And all of us, Omar, come over here. We just want you to sit in the room for a second. Right? And the Sahaba just sat and he asked her to slap her husband because the manner by which he hit her was not according to the ayah. And of course she cried and she refused and she hugged her husband and they lived happily ever after. <laughs> right? So it has to be in a situation, that's the regulatory process. It has to be in a, in a situation of no shoes. Right? Number two, you have to follow the steps. فَعِذَهُنَّ Admonish, give advice, communicate, articulate. And number two, you have to do the whole uh, reverse psychology in bed type thing. Right? And number three, you can hit. But if you do that at any other time, under any other justification, the state can punish you. And you can actually go to prison for that. Imam ibn Hazm said the same thing in his book, Al Muhalla. Right? Except for that mawdah, for that uh, situation of nashus. It is not halal for any man to lay a finger on his wife except when in a state of nashus. Now some of you might say, okay, what is, what is light hitting? The Prophet ﷺ explained that in Hajjatul Wada'ah, the farewell, the farewell sermon. Okay? All of you, if you've ever read the farewell sermon, all of you have been exposed to the hadith of Jabir ibn Abdullah that was mentioned in Sahih Muslim. That is where, where the story is. All of us get our story about the farewell sermon from Sahih Muslim fi hadith Jabir ibn Abdullah. Now there is another interesting narration in Tirmidhi. And in that narration, it basically says, the narrator of the hadith says that the Prophet ﷺ kept giving us advice about how we should treat our wives. He kept telling us, you know, فَوَعَضَ فِينَا وَعَضًا شَدِيدًا فِي أَمْرِ النِّسَاءِ ثُمَّ قَالْ إِلَّا أَنْ يَأْتِينَ بِفَاحِشَةٍ مُبَيِّنَةٍ so he kept giving them advice and admonishing them. You have to respect your wives. You have to love them. You can't hit them. You can't do this. You can't do that. And that's, again, the la that's the last year of the Prophet's life. Okay? 
until he said, Illa ayatina bi fahisha mubayyin, until they perform or they have committed a fahisha. Clear, unequivocal fahisha. Now let me ask the lay men and women here. What is your understanding of fahisha? What is fahisha in this context? What must it be? Adultery, right? Most people understand fahisha as adultery. And this is what Imam Shawkani said again, Nailul Autar, and, and, and the rest of the Mufassireen followed him on this as well. And if they do commit zina, subhanallah, if they do commit adultery while married, right? That's when you can hit them darban ghayr mubarrih. Now, Abdullah ibn Abbas wanted to understand again what, what we're trying to understand. Ya Rasulullah, what is darban ghayr mubarrih? What is light hitting? And later on, when asked, he would tell them, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, an, ay, ay an yadribha bisiwaki wa mashabah. He hits her with a miswak or something similar. Ya Allah. Let me just show you how the Prophet is raising the bar. First, it used to be justified on offenses such as nushus, right? The Prophet ﷺ upped the bar and he says, no, that's not enough anymore. That's not good enough. Nushus is not good enough. I am upping the bar and I'm saying it has to be a, a, a sexual offense that the wife commits against her husband. And it has to be so clear and unequivocal. And I mean, I want you to think about this. Clear and unequivocal and established means that there are shuhud, there are witnesses. So he, there's this guy walking on his wife and she's with another man and there are four people sitting on, on chairs, you know, drinking coffee. <laughs> Witnessing the whole thing and then they say, yes, yes, uh, we, we saw everything. And then he takes his miswak and he goes like... <laughs> Do you see how he upped the bar, Wasallam? From the shoes, he says, no, it has to be adultery. And that is the only situation where it becomes... So again, you have to go through the steps. And then the third one is hit with a miswak. Some of the sisters might be like, okay, that's just silly. What is the miswak? You know the miswak, if you don't know what the miswak is, it's that little stick that we use to you know, uh, uh, brush our teeth. Uh, think of a pencil, okay, just to make it easier on everyone. Think of a pencil, you just, one strike with a pencil like this. Some of the sisters will be like, hey, come on, what's the point? How is that going to change anything? And I say, hitting wives, according to the Quran, is a symbolic gesture of discontent. For a man who wants to keep the marriage together, who is willing to forgive his wife after she has committed adultery, for this, because he loves her, because he, he, he is willing to forgive her, and he wants to maintain and sustain his family and take care of his children. Which is a rare, a rare percentage, I would say, of men that would allow that. Most men, when they see something like this, they would just divorce their wives. Okay? Now, there's no place for honor killing in any of this. Do you see it? This is why we keep saying honor killing is murder. And you will stand before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as a murderer on the Day of Judgment. Because the Qur'an spoke clearly about how to handle sexual offenses in relationships. And he doesn't even talk about daughters. We're just talking about wives. Any, any other thing is not even mentioned in the Qur'an. You have no right to use, to use violence with them. The, the, the only right that is given is, you know, a strike with a pencil. If you, if you know unequivocally that your wife has committed zina, right? Now, some of you might say, and let me inshallah conclude with this. Some of you might say, oh, you're saying this is a symbolic gesture. What does it mean, really? When the husband strikes his wife with, with a pencil, I would say what the Prophet ﷺ meant is use a gesture of unhappiness and discontent that is compatible with your society and your culture. And that is how women would, would, would basically get hurt and get the idea that what they've done against their husbands is completely unacceptable. And in Arab society, they might respond to that simple gesture. Let me ask you a question. Right here in America, if a woman sees her husband cheating on her, it is perfectly acceptable for her to commit an act of violence against him that society never considers to be domestic abuse. What is that? She give him a good slap on his face. Bam! And then the, the husband that is a gentleman, respectful, 
cannot do anything. Like he just take he takes the slap. <laughs> right? Now let me ask you, Allah Alim, because people just keep attacking us. And they keep saying, Al Quran sanctions violence against women. Let me ask you. In American society, in a different cultural context, it's okay for a woman that saw her husband cheating on her, it's okay to slap him on the face. But it is not okay for the Muslim man to slap his wife on the face if he saw her cheating on him. How's that? This is the story of, of hitting women in the Quran, right there. At the end of the day, the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala turns out to have a more civilized and more beautiful code than all those man-made accepted cultural practices. And that's why this is the book of Allah. لَوْ أَنزَلْنَا هَذَا الْكِتَابَ عَلَى جَبَلٍ لَرَأَيْتَهُ خَاشِعًا If this Qur'an was revealed on a mountain, the mountain will shake. Why? Because the mountain will be able to see the secrets, the timeless secrets of the Qur'an. The applicability of the Qur'an. The, the consistency of the Qur'an across cultures, across civilizations. It is not 50 years ago in America, it was okay for the husband to slap his wife. A hundred years ago in America, it was perfectly fine for the husband to beat beat his wife, give her a good beating. Today it's okay for the wife to slap her husband. 25 years from today it'll be okay for the children to slap their mothers. Right? We're headed in that direction. And we keep adjusting the way we treat each other based on culture that is arbitrary. But the Quran is consistent. It doesn't matter where you are, what you do, what kind of culture, what kind of circumstances. You follow the letter of the Quran. And it is unfortunate how something so beautiful was manipulated, was twisted over the centuries, right? Despite the consensus of the scholars that, that, were, that men are not supposed to hit their wives, considering the ayah itself, it is just so unfortunate to see how there are scholars and shiuch and imams who would hold microphones like this to justify violence against women. And I say it here again, brothers and sisters, violence, violence against women is haram. Hitting your wife is haram. And if you are among that 0.1% of men that walks on his wife that, that, while she's cheating on you and she, you're still willing to maintain that relationship and not divorce her, sure, you can use your pencil and, and slap her once on her or tap her on the shoulder if you'd like. That's all we're going to allow. And I want you, inshallah ta'ala, to also understand something very important. The practices of divorce in Jahiliyyah were very simple. The husband divorces his wife. He doesn't want her to be with another man. So right before the Idda is over, like a day before the three months are over, he takes her back. And then two days later, he divorces her again. And he's doing this in a cycle that goes on for years to punish the wife, and she can't get out. Now, it's right to Khul'a. Ayah 229, Surah Al-Baqarah. Very famous ayah. Go back. Ayah 229. It sanctions both talaq and khul'a. It's, it's an unprecedented right that was given to, to, to Muslim women, basically. Now, put all those factors together. He has to do it in a state of nushuz. And the shoes was up to sexual offense. He has to talk to her first, abandoning in bed. And even if he uses hitting, he has to use a pencil. And he knows that she can divorce him herself if she wants to. Do you think any man that understands that would ever lay a finger on his wife? That's the guidance of the Quran that was lost. That's the guidance of the Quran that was lost. And I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that every single one of you will become an ambassador of peace. And take this strongly, unapologetically, and swiftly, and share this with courage with everyone out there. You can never be apologetic about the teachings of the Quran because in the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the ultimate, is the ultimate good. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to increase our knowledge of his deen. I ask him subhanahu wa ta'ala to establish us with firmness on his path. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to guide us to make the best decisions and choices possible under the most difficult of circumstances. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make each and every, one of us, uh, and every one of us the best representation of Islam and to help us make da'wah and inspire others to the path of the deen uh, with our gentleness, with our love and wisdom and with our actions. Allahumma ameen. Aqulu qawli hadha astaghfirullah li wa lakum wa khumu ila salatikum wa rahamakum Allah.